What's the longest lived organism on Earth? Many people would say a tree, perhaps a bristlecone pine or something like that. But the true answer, as far as we know, is maybe a little bit more surprising. As is how on Earth we work all this stuff out. Hello and welcome. My last instalment on the hexactin problem was a bit of a monster and um, slightly on the heavy side, so this one is going to be a bit of light relief. Not that that actually put you lot off based on the number of new subscribers. Well done you. Um, but this one is um, one of those little questions that's actually really good fun to dive into, because even as I was preparing for this, I discovered some things I hadn't realised and that the answer wasn't quite what I thought. Possibly. Before we start to tackle the question of what the oldest living organism is, you have to make a few definitions. It's a bit like saying that the Sears Tower in Chicago was at one point the tallest building in the world, as long as you discount the ones which are double structures, or anything with a radio mast on top, or... yeah, you get the idea. So I'm going to start off by discounting clonal forests, for example. So there are various plants that multiply prolifically by as clones, so they sort of branch um, from the root network quite often, and a new one pops up, and then that branches, and a new one pops up from there. And each tree is technically connected to the others, so you could argue that the whole thing was one organism. And if you do, then there's a seagrass colony in the Mediterranean, which is estimated to be something between 15,000 and 200,000 years old. And there's a quaking aspen um, clonal colony in Utah, I think it is, which, the Pando colony, which is estimated again to be possibly up to 80,000 years old. But each individual tree or seagrass plant, of course, is much, much younger. So to me, that is cheating. We're not going there. Not having that at all. Sorry. Another form of not quite playing fair is when you get to sort of good old age and then you just regress to childhood and start again. Again and again and again. And then you get things like the immortal jellyfish, which is actually a hydrozoan uh, rather than a scyphozoan, which is what we normally think of as jellyfish. But they have different stages in their life cycle. Uh, so one sort of medusa stage and one polyp stage. And they can keep regressing back to the polyp stage and then starting again. They just return to basically stem cells and they completely negate all the aging. And theoretically, this can carry on for quite a long time, which is interesting. But does that count as being the longest lived thing? Well, the problem is we don't know. So I would imagine that although theoretically these things can carry on growing, they don't because something eats them, for example. So I'm not entirely sure what to make of these technically immortal things because although they're technically immortal, we have no evidence that any of these lives more than 10 years or so. We just have not recorded it. Similarly, there are actually quite a lot of animals out there that have technically no aging mechanism. Their rate of mortality actually decreases as they get older. So you get things like the sturgeon, for example, which given enough supplies and enough good conditions can, as far as we know, just carry on going and growing at the same time. These things get bigger with age, and so you used to get occasional gigantic sturgeons that sort are of 10 metres long, which were thought to be 100, 150 years old, and presumably eventually they just they fail because there's not enough food for them anymore. But theoretically, again, they're immortal animals. But in practice, well, reality has a way of catching up with them when you try to just become a giant. So if we're talking about individual organisms where we can actually demonstrate how old an individual is, 
Then we get to things that are fairly obvious to start with, like trees. Of course, trees make it nice and easy for us because they have growth things. So you can actually um, take a sample through the middle with a corer, um, rather than just cutting down the whole tree, ideally. Accidents have happened. Um, but some of the oldest that we ever encountered are things like the bristlecone pines. And these can get up to about 5,000 years verified. There's one called Methuselah, which is 4,857 years. That was probably a couple of years ago. But I think there's another unnamed one that's about, th about 5,000. So these are absolutely categorical, incontrovertible ones, which definitely live that long. Which is pretty impressive. I mean, 5,000 years is going back to the early days of ancient Egypt, for example dynastic Egypt. So it's, yeah, it, it's going back a long time. There are lots of other animals where we can be pretty certain, animals and plants, of the uh, exact age. So there is an Arctic quahog clam, a type of bivalve, which has been dated to 507 years because, like trees, they produce growth rings. So the shells grow incrementally and you can simply count up the rings to give you an exact age. There are others where it's a little bit vaguer. So, for example, there are vestimentifolan tube worms living around cold seeps, where the growth rate has been measured by comparing one year to the next, and then you extrapolate from that, and you get an answer of between one and three hundred years for most of them, quite possibly up to a thousand years in some cases. But we don't have a definite answer. It's, it's probably accurate, but it's not precise. And you're never quite sure about growth rates varying. That can be a problem. There are also things like black corals, deep sea, chitinous skeleton little colonies, which are extremely slow going. I think estimates go to about 10 micrometers a year, which is pretty tiny. And these also live into the thousands. So one has been estimated to be about 4,300 or so years old, another one 2,500 years, but uh, that one was actually date carbon dated from the, the core of the holdfast as well, so you get the original bit that was laid down, you can carbon date, and the colony was still thriving at, um, yeah, two, over, well over 2,000 years later. But these, of course, are colonies. And in individual zooids within them, individual polyps, probably don't live anything like that long, although they may well be very long-lived themselves in some ways. But um, does it count? Mm, well, it doesn't beat the bristlecone pine anyway, so we don't have to worry about it, luckily. There are some animals, though, that, without cheating, can beat the conifers no problem at all. Not this species. I haven't got an example of the ones that have actually been dated to ridiculous ages, but this is a glass sponge, a hexaxonellid, which you know all about now if you watched any of my other videos. But some of these hexaxonellids have been dated by various means to ridiculous ages. We know, for example, from things like growth rates and geochemical analyses of the tissues, isotopic studies and so on, that a few thousand years is probably quite common, particularly under the Antarctic ice and in the very deep seas where a lot of them live. You have a large number of species living to a very decent age. However, there are records that surpass that by miles. Whether they're convincing is the challenging part. So some are not widely accepted in the sponge biology community. For example, there was a study um, describing the age of Anoxicalyx jubini from Antarctica as being between 15,000 and 23,000 years old. However, this was based on fairly experimental techniques that are difficult to really rely on, and other, other approaches have given much, much younger ages for the same thing. So in those particular cases, we're not sure. But there is one case where we do know with pretty high certainty that we have a winner so far. 
This is Monovaphus chuni. It's a strange thing. It's the only member of its family, the Monovaphidae, and it secretes a basal spicule, a single anchoring spicule, rather than a dense tuft of lots of them which it tangles into the seafloor, like you get in something like the wonderful Euplectella, that's the sort of tuft at the bottom full of little fibrous bits. Um, rather than that, we have a single spicule. But this spicule can get to be an inch thick and three meters long. Nice mixing of units there. Lovely. Oh well. And these are quite impressive structures. But because they are secreted from the body of the sponge, they're not actually living tissue. They are secreted and then they're basically just dead by a mineral. That means they're being secreted from one end at a time. And so it grows incrementally. And there are layers within the spicule. Very, very fine layers that you can count. There's one problem though, in that it doesn't secrete them annually. Because you don't really have much in the way of seasons in the deep ocean. So there's no regularity to when these layers were laid down. It probably depended on their food supply and local temperature variations and things like that. So how do you do it? How do you work out the age of something where you've got layers in it, but you don't know what the layers represent? Well, in this case, it's made of silica, opal, which is silicon dioxide. So it's composed of silicon and oxygen. And it secretes this skeleton in equilibrium with the seawater. So it's extracting the oxygen and the silicon from dissolved solutions. And then it is creating this crystal and growing it as it goes. So as it's picking up bits of oxygen from the seawater, it's picking up the isotopic signature of the oxygen. There are different atomic weights of oxygen atoms, and the exact ratio of oxygen um, 18 to oxygen 16 is actually dependent on the amount of ice on land, because there is preferential evaporation of the lighter oxygen, and therefore more of the heavier oxygen is left behind in the sea when the, um, when the water is extracted from the sea and turned into ice caps. So we can actually see this record of isotopic changes in seawater, which we can record from the shells of sea creatures, for example, and even from ice core records. We can get an idea of how the balance is changing through time. Which is wonderful, because we can then take all these measurements, as this, these authors have done, all the way along this spicule, and match it up with the oxygen isotope curve for the water that we have from other means. And in those other means it's dated because they're in layers with carbon dating or whatever. And what you find is that this one example that they analysed seems to show the end of the last glaciation. You see the, the spikes in oxygen isotopes which correspond to the changes around 11,000 years ago. And this isn't even the oldest one. There are probably many which are substantially older. This was just a two meter long spicule. They do get bigger than that. So this individual was probably at least 11,000 years old and they may well get to 15 or 20,000. Now that's not bad going. Go on, you knew the answer was gonna be sponges, didn't you? Why am I still here? Oh, it's not sponges. Well, it might be. Might not. Okay, there is another contender. Bacteria. Yes, I know, it's really annoying. But, you see, there are these things called endoliths. These are bacteria, and other things as well actually, but mainly bacteria that live inside rocks usually between the grains in the pore spaces, and they can eke out a living under the most inauspicious of circumstances. So there's virtually no energy. They are often key mortar truths, so they're making their metabolism work by 
using the surrounding crystals. And the very limited energy that they have apparently mostly goes into repairing damage caused by cosmic rays rather than growing or dividing. And because of that, they don't divide for a very, very long time. And with bacteria, we have to really take the lifespan as being the regeneration time, because once it splits, it's become its own children. But that lifespan, in some cases, apparently is about 10,000 years. And given that we've only just started to understand these things, and yet we have been finding endoliths in rocks kilometers down under the ground, probably descendants of bacteria that were captured in the rocks before they were subducted or buried under mountain ranges millions of years ago. We have to assume that some of these individual cells are probably more than 10,000 years old, much as I hate to admit it. But then, just in case that's not sort of embarrassing enough for the, uh, the sponge contingent, there are bacteria, and spores particularly, resting stages of bacteria, that appear to be able to survive through geological time. This is something that's been developing over the last decade or two, really. Uh, first things were bacteria apparently reanimated from inside amber, 40 million years old, and yet still viable. DNA is meant to break down in that length of time, but somehow within these reproductive structures, things like spores or resting stages, they are able to survive. And the record for this at the moment is currently reasonably well accepted, I think, at 250 million years old from a brine inclusion inside a salt crystal in Chile, I think it was. But to be honest, if it can last 250 million years in a state of stasis, suspended animation or dormancy, and then come back to life and start feeding and growing and reproducing when the conditions are right, then there is probably no limit to how long that these things can survive if the conditions are suitable. Which is a really interesting point to end on, especially as I just want to remind you that occasionally I am interested in things like astrobiology. And there is this idea of panspermia, that life from one planet can get to other planets after large asteroid impacts, for example, which basically blast chunks of rock out through the atmosphere into interplanetary space, and millions of years later they land on another planet and come back to life again, or things inside them could. And when you see evidence like this, it seems entirely plausible that that could happen. It seems almost inevitable that that could happen. Which leads to the question of, are we all Martians? Did life originate somewhere else entirely? Yeah, nice answered question to keep you awake at night. I shall leave it there for now. I've got some weird fossils coming up next. And boy, do I mean weird.